Talk is a significant challenge for so many autistic people. And especially if you are high masking and the research shows that if you do not have an intellectual disability, you are more likely to mask, which then adds to the fact that maybe you are masking and pushing and trying to live in a world not built to accommodate your needs. And so your reserves are even smaller. It's like the depletion that you feel happens much more quickly when things like you know, sensory issues and executive functioning and lack of routine or not, all of these things, when they're, when those are out of whack, it can significantly affect how you function and definitely increase autistic burnout. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. And in today's video, we're going to talk about four main signs of autistic burnout, how it's important to differentiate that from depression, but to understand it can often preload depression and some things you can do if you believe you might be in autistic burnout or getting very close. So first of all, what is an autistic burnout? It is not depression, like I said, but it is really a full depletion and exhaustion of mental, physical, and emotional resources as they relate to things like our prefrontal cortex, our nervous system, and how we are going through the world. Like I said, if you are high masking, you're much more likely to experience burnout and maybe not even realize it, but a lack, um, a lack of skills and resources that normally are hard to access can become even more difficult or ones that you kind of white knuckle because you've learned to set up life this way. But as a result, you are feeling more and more you know, depleted and struggling. So let's talk about four main signs that you could be knocking on the door of autistic burnout. Number one is chronic fatigue and exhaustion. This is really about feeling that you have no energy, no motivation, no resources. And it really is a big piece of how burnout is playing out in your body. It might look like a more frequent state of isolation, of freeze, of shutdown, of collapse, where you, even if you don't have brain fog, which you could, your brain might want to do something, but your body can't and or vice versa, or both. And so it feels like this wipe out in your body where you just find yourself lying on the sofa, you can't get motivated. And it's not just about the fact that you need recovery time because you socialized yesterday. It might be even worse than usual, or maybe you couldn't even go do the things you normally do because you just could not get your mind and body in motion due to chronic exhaustion. Number, Number two is frequent emotional dysregulation. So your ability to access things like how you navigate your frustrations, your sadness, your grief, your struggles, your anxiety in terms of your emotions might look like a lot more irritability, which is very common for anxiety. It can often look like irritation, agitation, or just meltdowns and, and breakdowns where you feel like you don't have the capacity emotionally to tackle and handle the things you normally do. Number three is increased sensitivity to your sensory issues. When we talk about something like Dan Siegel's window of tolerance, this idea of how much we can handle before we blow our lid or shut down and collapse is often it's decreasing during an autistic burnout. And so things like the normal triggers around sights and smells and sounds and textures and noise and lighting, all of those things, I think I repeated myself, all of those, it's like your capacity again is not so great. And so you're that much more bothered, that much more triggered by those things. So you're having a hard time and maybe being overstimulated much more easily than you quote unquote normally are. The fourth one is really a loss of skills around executive functioning. So how you think and remember and create and process and organize and plan, all of that is impacted. You might have brain fog, you might be forgetful, but you're noticing that your ability to kind of stay on task is even more difficult than usual. So for many of us, things we don't want to do, which is classic bill pay, cleaning, all of that, 
and this is true for everybody, the things you don't enjoy, you want to put off. But if you have ADHD and autism, for example, those things can be not only even less rewarding, but even more depleting. And so you're even more behind on those things, perhaps, than you normally were. It can look like a disinterest if you're more socially motivated in seeing your friends or connection. It can look like poor hygiene and self-care, not necessarily sleeping well, not feeding yourself well, not being able to do whatever version of exercise when you are in your best game you're able to do. It can look like an inability to actually work as it continues to perform tasks and really functioning at all. Uh, neglect and self-care and and uh, substance use, all these other kinds of things you're trying to use to kind of get yourself lit up and manage. And you're noticing that your quality of life and enjoyment and abilities are declining. So what often creates this? Of course, living in a world that's not built for us with accommodations, understanding things like our work environments and home environments, the demands of daily life. You know, we have to get the diet and go to school and eat the right foods and exercise and pay our bills, like I was saying, and do laundry. And, you know, it's just, it's endless. And so that can add to it. Um, we can have mental and physical health issues. Our environment we're living in can be impacted. Perhaps we have a roommate who travels and when they're gone, it's better. But when they're not, they're triggering at home a lot lately because they're struggling, for example, or our kids are. So a lot of that can be impactful. And the reason why we often struggle is because we have internalized that we're supposed to be able to do things like everybody else. And I will tell you this as a psychologist that very few people are anywhere close to checking the boxes of all the things in life. But so many of us feel shame and hide and aren't honest about how and where and how really, how much we truly struggle. So that internalized ableism about you know, when you have a disability or a challenge or a whatever you want to call it, I, you know, I know there's debate between calling these things disability or not, but the truth is that they don't put us at the same, same starting level. They are challenges and difficulties. And so we don't necessarily know that especially if we're high masking, we've always, like I said, white knuckled it, we might not realize when it's, when it's even harder. So understanding that that can be a part of it. Also, what's important is to just come to terms with sort of like what your capacity is, that maybe it fluctuates. Maybe there's some grief work to do there about the things you know that you just won't be able to do. Maybe it's about, you know, letting yourself come to terms with your strengths and your challenges in a loving, compassionate way so that you stop setting yourself up with all of these shoulds of, well, my neighbor can do that or my best friend can do that. Why can't I do that? And there can be some real work to do there. The next thing is to get clear on where you struggle, what your symptoms are, what your triggers are, what helps it, what makes it worse when it comes to burnout, you know, to recognize that maybe doing two or three things on a weekend right now is just, even though that was always a lot for you, it's really too much. Maybe it's doing nothing this weekend and, for example, taking care of yourself. Setting up accommodations from sensory issues and triggers, wearing things like earphones more often, noise canceling earphones, letting yourself eat the same thing every day if it's decently he healthy enough, right? You're getting some calories and feel okay to stop shooting yourself about what that could look like, maybe asking your boss to work from home for a few days during this time period, talking to your family, asking for more supports, ordering meals out, like really thinking about what are the legs under the table that would really help me right now. So really looking at those, is it more, more connection, less connection, things like that. Looking at, you know, self-care, things like sleep and eating, I will tell you nothing is more impactful to your mental health than sleep. And we know for autistic people, sleep is often a huge challenge. So looking at how you feel good and what you can do in terms of sleep to get better quality, to set more boundaries for yourself, which can be challenging. And certainly for so many autistic people, we see that there are chronic illnesses, autoimmune disease and PCOS, fibromyalgia. And so it may be that your, you know, your diet right now is actually not serving you and you're not moving your body enough. It really is impactful to understand that when you live in a state of chronic nervous system dysregulation, there's not like, oh, I'm going to fix that and check that box. It's an ongoing everyday activation and intention around that. But that things like exercise, just taking a walk in the blue green environment in nature and getting some cardio 
can be incredibly helpful to see it as one of your tools and your toolbox, but frankly, an important one. Trying to get back into routines. This can be really important because when we're off our game, we're often, like I'm saying, not eating, not sleeping, not doing the things we normally do. And so trying to get back on track, even if it takes you a little while, back into the things that you know help protect your sensory environment, help soothe you, help you be more uh, successful and increase that window of tolerance. So look at that. At the core, using things like stimming and, you know, skills and tools that help you navigate your feelings and your thoughts and your body's need to move if that's the case. So maybe you have a massage, maybe you get more stimming toys right now, maybe you do little breaks to hum and sing. You know, when I go for my walk, sometimes when no one's out, now that the tourists are gone in Laguna, I'll have my, you know, my earphones on and I will sing, you know, Fleetwood Mac or Stevie Nicks or Taylor Swift, whatever, just to get my, my voice moving and going and away from something like my phone. Other times it's just completely quiet. I listen to nothing. I try to just listen to the sound and be present. And of course, research podcasts, which I love on autism.org. But the point is try to find ways to self-soothe that rebuild resources and to give yourself permission to do so. Incredibly important. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you for being here. And by the way, this is a great time to share with you my brand new podcast coming out called Girl Rotting. It is a podcast with me, Dr. Kim Sage. And it's a place for me to dive into all of my passions and pop culture topics. We're going to talk a lot about psychology, pop culture, TV shows, but always through the lens of narcissism, trauma, borderline, neurodivergence. And I'll also be sharing hopefully interviews and psychological research there as well. And if you're not familiar with the rotting trend, which I know sounds terrible, but it's this idea that in its best case, it's a way to reset and have self-care. For example, a day rotting at home alone in your bed or on your sofa, covered in blankets with your favorite books and your fur babies and your laptop and whatever it is. It's a fine line between a day rotting and a lifetime rotting. And it can go into depression. But the goal of my podcast is to share with you all the things that I do from my own space, from my sofa, from my bed maybe sometimes, the, the favorite snacks and ideas and shows and really just bring that part to life that I don't necessarily always get to. It's a new challenge for me and something I'm very excited about. And so I hope you'll join me. I've got two podcasts lined up to share in the next couple of days. And so I hope you'll check those out. So thank you so much for being here. Please, if you need a day of rotting, do it. If you need mental health treatment because you're rotting too much, do that as well. But know that whatever you're feeling is valid and it matters, but you are the only one that is going to be able to set up your life in a way to take care of yourself and hopefully move yourself out of burnout and to increase that window of tolerance and well-being in your life. So thanks for being here. Please stay safe and well, and I'll see you soon.